on with what we're going to talk about. Um, again, welcome to Theory of Machines Live. Um, Matt, first of all, we are based in our demo room at Tech Equipment's headquarters. I'm Dion Knowles, I've got Kyle Hatchard and I've got Matt Fellows here. Matt is going to tell us about the real world of the theory of machines. Um, I put it in context, talking about your earlier career with helicopters, aren't you? That's right, Dion. So, uh, so my, my career actually started off in the Royal Navy where I was a aircraft engineering technician. Um, I spent the majority of that time working on um, helicopters for the Sea King, um, which we actually have a photo of on the screen right now. Um, we thought that it would be a, a really good uh, exercise for, for, for this YouTube video to, um, to actually demonstrate where our equipment fits in to the, um, where our experiment, where our equipment, so hold on, I'm just being told that I need to swap microphones, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, so as I was saying, um, we thought it would be good to uh, just, just show where our equipment fits into the real world of theory of machines. We have quite a bit of equipment around me right now that we're going to talk about, so what, well, what we'll do, we'll start with the centrifugal um, force equipment. Um, if you look to the top of the aircraft, you'll see the rotor blades. Now, each one of those rotor blades are quite heavy, and they have a tip mass on them as well. Um, as they rotate, they're going to create a, a large amount of centrifugal force, and that in turn is going to apply a force onto the drive shaft. Um, to prevent the vibrations from that force causing damage to the drive shaft or to create, cr prevent any vibrations really, those have to be very carefully um, adjusted or balanced. And as I say, that ties in really nicely with our centrifugal force equipment. Um, running down the spine of the aircraft, we have another drive shaft. Now, this is going from the main rotor gearbox all the way down to the tail gearbox. It goes through an intermediate gearbox on its way, changes angles a few times. It's quite a long drive shaft. Um, in, uh, in the video that we are doing today, we're going to demonstrate something called whirling of shafts. And whirling of shafts ties in really nicely with this concept of long drive shafts or transmitting rotational forces down a long drive shaft. On the, uh, on the drive shaft on the Seeking, there is uh, what's called a viscous damper bearing, and that viscous damper bearing is used to prevent excessive vibrations. Um, we also have in the electrical, uh, in the electrical um, compartment, which is a bit hard to see, but it's on the nose of the aircraft, we have two gyroscopes. And again, those gyroscopes are going to be uh, demonstrated today. Kyle's actually going to run us through our gyroscope equipment in a little while. I'm going to bring Dion back on now. Well done, Matt. Right. Um, so before we start looking at the teaching equipment in detail, I'd like to introduce you to the Elastic Band Car Race Challenge. We've got our export sales team that have been set a challenge to design an, an, and build an elastic band race car during this YouTube live streaming. And at the very end, we're going to uh, race those cars and see who's created the best car. Now, in the corner, I've got Adnan Rifai with the team. Now, we're just going to blank the screen a second as we transition to that, so bear with us one moment. We're going to walk over now to Adnan and his team in the corner. Okay, Adnan. Thank you, Dion. Yes, we have a nice challenge here set up for the export team, namely Bruno and Phil, who will be trying to build something similar to this. Now, this is a car we made earlier, and it's made of uh, CDs, uh, bobbins, uh, barbecue sticks, elastic bands, as well as just a a tube from an aluminium foil or something similar. Now, the team, like I, let me introduce you to Bruno. Bruno, come on here and tell us about what is your plan for today. Hello, Adnan. Hello, YouTube. So my plan is to follow the instructions. It's my first time making a rubber band car, but I'm confident. I think we have a good team supporting us. So let's see what how it goes. Thank you, Adnan. Thanks, Bruno. On the other aisle, we've got Phil, who is going to be representing Canada in this challenge. Phil, yes. how are you feeling about this? 
I'm feeling quite confident. Uh, I think uh, the match is, is for me already. I think I'm going to crush Bruno. Dion, I think we've got a good challenge set up here and I look forward to how this is going to be going forward. Back to you, Dion. I'm looking forward to seeing what happens as well. Okay, so now we're going to head back over to Kyle. Kyle, um, if you bear with us one moment as we transition over to that corner. Thank you. Kyle, Thanks you're, um, what, what, what are you going to be showing us? So we're moment? looking now at the basics, really. So um, a simple pendulum module. Um, this is part of our TM160 range, uh, the TM161. Um, this allows students really to get to grips with simple harmonics. Um, if you can imagine, so you've got a basically a simple pendulum, pendulum at the end of a string um, and uh, you apply a force. Currently, if you uh, have it at the center point, it's currently in equilibrium. You apply a force and therefore the effect of that is that you have an equal and opposite force. So you've got Newton's third law that's at play. That's better. Um, and it allows students to really get to grips with that simple harmonic motion of um, a system. All the materials as well, it's worth noting, come with the uh, learning materials, the student guide, and also, in addition, a lecturer's guide. We also then move on to um, the compound pendulum, which allows students to then build further into the understanding, for example, um, you know, really basic simple theory in regards to how gyroscopes work and operate as well where you've got a fixed rod a weight applied at the end where you can adjust that varying weight and that allows you to see how the pendulum is affected either by the gravity and also the period um, in which it is obviously oscillating Kyle, can you tell me some real world examples? Yeah, uh, for that's a really good these. question. So um, <laughs> we've got the simple pendulum, which would you believe it? Obviously, everybody knows the uh, sort of grandfather clock. You see those yep. you know, quite regularly. Um, but also they use them in civil engineering applications, for example, at the top of a skyscraper. Okay. So you've got a huge, long, tall building. And if you have an earthquake, the uh, pendulum is utilized to then dampen the effect or the frequency and uh, the oscillations of the building to obviously prevent it from uh, deflecting completely and falling over. Okay, brilliant. So. Good, good, good. Um, do you want to uh, take us through and let's have a look at um, this particular apparatus here the as well. The free and forced, uh, well, free and torsional vibrations, the TM165, um, absolutely. So basically, very straightforward. This allows students to understand the oscillation um, due to the diameter of um, a torsional bar. Um, and that allows students also then to extract that data into our VDAS software um, and plot the varying changes or the oscillation period um, for that particular um, diameter. There's a variety of diameters that are available. Um, and also, you can also add a damping effect to that uh, frequency. Right, I just want to remind everybody who, if you are watching this live today, do feel free to ask your questions. I'm checking them as they come up here and we'll be feeding those through to the team. Kyle, when would I really want to know about this in the real world? Yeah, absolutely. That's another one really to apply to real life. Um, the example that I would typically give would be perhaps at the end of uh, maybe a diamond drill that's um, boring through uh, concrete, for example, and it hits a particularly um, solid piece of material, yeah. um, it, begin, it begins to sort of um, get stuck, yeah. and therefore you get torsional vibration that's fed back through um, the shaft that's driving okay. the uh, particular drill head. Okay, right. Thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you. Now, I can hear various little clicks and whisperings going on in the corner where the elastic band car challenges are busy at work. Let's go back and see how they are doing. We're going to transition now uh, to the other end of the room, so bear with us one moment. Yes, you're right, Dion. You hearing is perfectly good because we have some clicks and clap, but nothing more than that as the team is trying to settle into the challenge and uh, discover their components and try to make something of it. Now, I have to say, we also have a hand and a helping hand from no other 
than our good old friend here, Antonio. Antonio, uh, how do you think the teams are uh, shaping up? I think they are doing very well. Well, here you go. You heard it from Antonio. And I don't know whether the camera can spot what's happening here, but we've got some activity on the field side. Yes, something is shaping up, whereas I believe Bruno is still struggling to make uh, sense of uh, his... Yeah, well, let's see how this uh, goes on for the next stopover. And in the meantime, Dion, how are uh, we getting on with the rest of the live? Okay, right. Well, I just should remind everybody we're going to move on to looking at the free and forced vibrations experiment. Bear with us a second. As we're doing that, uh, you are free to make suggestions to the car builders. Uh, if you're seeing somebody's particularly uh, struggling with a point or you're really rooting for them, then please do you put your comments in the comment box so that we can feed that back to them if you are watching this live. Obviously, if you're watching this on demand, you can still put your comments in the comment box below. Anyway, Kyle, right, free and forced vibrations. Yeah, thank you, Dion. So um, we're going to talk about the ten, uh, the TM ten sixteen V. So the V means that it's got VDAS on board. Um, that just means that people can obviously extract that data straight to a laptop, straight through our VDAS software, um, and create the necessary graphs. Um, that you will be able to create from this system. So you've got the control panel on the left where you've got acceleration and displacement. You've got a speed control and obviously the on and off switch. On the right hand side, you've got a simply supported beam setup with an offset oscillating motor, um, which then applies a load and a force to the beam, which is then fed back through this sensor, which then allows the student to plot varying graphs and up to around six different experiments. So you can see here as an example. But also, not only that, you, you're obviously exploring a simple beam, but you can also explore rigid beams. So you can either induce a force yourself or you can use, obviously, the motor system with damping effects such as the spring and also the viscous damping pot here. So that's also introducing students into how fluid mechanics and um, hydraulics really affect uh, a, a damping system or a vibration system. This viscous damping pot, when would you use that in the real world? Yeah, so Matt inclinated before um, around the drive shaft uh, for a helicopter. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've got varying oscillations in that drive shaft and you need a mechanism to really absorb those vibrations in that system. Okay. Um, and maintain sort of that natural resonance. Um, again, building on that resonance, Dion, you can also analyze using Dunkley's method um, and extract um, some data to actually calculate the resonance of the beam. So, yeah, and then building further from that single degree of freedom, you can also add here a weight system. So this now becomes two degrees of freedom. So you've got the initial single degree of freedom and then you're applying two degrees of freedom within the system. This allows then students to move a series of weights to then stabilize the system and for me uh, when I was studying at two degrees of freedom I did find the maths and the theory quite heavy. The beauty of this piece of equipment is that it extracts that maths and, and everything in that theory, theoretical learning that's based in the classroom mm -hmm. you know and draws you back into a more applied learning environment that really allows students to actually get to grips quite quickly with that complex theory. Um, so yeah, this is a really fantastic piece of, pro uh, piece of equipment. Everything comes with a five-year warranty um, with the student guide and student lecture notes. So all the work's done for you. It's just about implementing it into your learning plan. So yeah, Great. thank you, Great, and the damping options on this? Yeah, um, so we've got a variety of damping op options. So you've got the um, oh, viscous sorry, pot. You did explain I did, it. but I'm no, it's sorry. okay. You obviously weren't listening. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. Bottom of the class point. for you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Pay more attention. Um, can we actually see it running? Are we set up for we that? We can do. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So if we take the valve here, because we haven't got it fixed, we can li simply induce a speed into that. If we press the on button, that would help. So as you can see, the motor rotating, and you can vary the acceleration. And the one thing to mention as well with this is that, that 
the one thing to mention with this as well is that it's actually a non-contacting accelerometer that's um, applied to the system. So what that means is that it doesn't interfere with the resonance of the beam. So you're getting accurate results um, back to the calculation. Okay, great. Shall I turn that off now? Yeah, perfect. Fantastic. Okay, so at this point, we're ready to see how the elastic band race car challenges are getting on in the corner. Uh, we're going Thank to transition you. over to those. Thank you, Kyle. How are you getting on? Thank you, Dion. We started to see some shape. Now I'm going to go straight to uh, Bruno here so that he can himself tell us how he is getting on with his challenge. Bruno, how do you think this is going? I think it's going well. So we have made some progress here. So we have already prepared the axis. Um, we are now trying to fix the elastic. That will give us some energy to get the car rolling. So you uh, looks like Bruno knows what he's talking about, and he's got what one third of the car made there. Uh, yes, possibly yes. Yeah. So we've got one third of the car made on the Bruno side. We'll come back to Phil later on. Thank you. Here we go, Dion. I'll uh, send them back to you. Yeah. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk to Matt. Now we're going to be talking about centrifugal forces and uh, static and dynamic balancing. Apologies there. We're going to transition over at this point. Okay, so Matt's all getting set up in this corner. I'm going to hand the mic over to you now, Matt. Centrifugal forces. That's right. Real world first, if we can. Oh, real world first. Okay, so we, we had the example earlier of the, uh, of the aircraft um, with the... Uh, with the masses and the balancing of the masses on the rotor blades, but another place where we use centrifugal force and we use it usefully as opposed to trying to reduce its effects is in laboratory settings where you have a centrifuge. So these are used during blood tests and it allows, um, it allows laboratory technicians to separate um, different density fluids um, within a tube. <coughs> Here we have the centrifugal force equipment um, it consists of a LCD display uh, with a press and hold zero force uh, button, and a motor that can be a motor controller that can be dri drive the motor in either direction, and that is it. It is really simple for students to use. VDAS data output, and we have a, a really useful key here for the mass sizes. We've got an interlocked guard. By removing that, we would instantaneously stop the experiment, which is obviously really good from, a, uh, from the perspective of lab safety. As you can see here, I've already set a few masses onto the arms. We have two arms on this piece of equipment that are connected to a load cell, and we have a single arm in the center that's not connected to the load cell. The two arms on the outside, as we increase the mass, or increase the, um, the distance from the radius, we're going to see the increase in centrifugal force. The arm in the middle is utilized for balancing. So students can run this piece of equipment without a balancing mass on it, and they'll see that there's some vibration within the system. And then when they balance it out to overcome that moment being applied by the masses, they'll then be able to see um, how that vibration goes. On the LCD display, you're going to get a force reading and you're also going to get your angular velocity reading. So with the force, uh, sorry, with the angular velocity, the mass and the radius position, you have control over all the variables in, um, involved in centrifugal force, which allows you to then carry out your theoretical calculations and compare it to the measured readings that you get on the screen. We're now going to move slightly to the right here where we've got static and dynamic balancing. Static and dynamic balancing, great piece of equipment. It's, it's um, very easy to use again. In this case, it only has a motor drive, but you can also utilize it without the motor where you're going to apply a force, a constant force, utilizing the pulley here. Matt. Why do we really need to understand static and dy dynamic balancing? A static and dynamic balancing is really important. Essentially, what we're looking at is applied centrifugal force. Now, I was given a great example of this earlier, which is your washing machine. 
we've all loaded our washing machine up with the sheets or we've loaded it up, up, up with a towel or something along those lines. And when you turn it on and it goes up to its high spin, it starts bouncing across the, the kitchen mm -hmm. floor. Well, that is because the drum is unbalanced. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you might damage your washing machine. You may have to buy yourself a new one. Unlikely, it's probably going to survive. In the cases of high-speed rotating shafts, it becomes a little bit more important. We have one of these on the aircraft that we looked at earlier, high-speed rotating shaft along the tail. If you lose that, you're really going to know about it. It's not going to end well for you. Okay, okay, right. Now I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I was saying, with the, with the pulley here, that allows you to initially look at a uh, two-mass system and statically balance it. Um, students um, are able to statically balance it just by having two masses opposing each other um, on opposite sides of the, uh, of the shaft here. Unfortunately though, that's not a truly balanced system, it's not dynamically balanced. In order to dynamically balance it, they're going to need to utilise a little bit more maths and they're going to have to use the other masses on here. When we're looking at dynamically balancing the system, we're then going to drive it with the motor. And as I said, this is controlled down here. Again, this equipment is um, interlocked to prevent students from injuring themselves during use. Removing the guard will turn the motor off. OK, let's see in action. OK. Now, we had this balanced by one of our friends and family last night. And we've got a little bit of vibration in there, but they've done a really good job. And that's testament really to how easy this equipment is for people to just come along and start using it. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Matt. Now, I'm conscious that the pressure is on our race car our challenges in the corner. We really need to go back and see how they're getting on because the clock is ticking, guys. Um, I'm going to move over to that other side of the corner now. Don't forget to put, post your suggestions in there. Uh, let's load on a bit of pressure. Adnan, do now tell us more. Dion, I, I do think they need suggestions. Uh, we are coming to a uh, dead end here, it seems. As the teams are struggling a little, now I've been looking at what Phil has been doing, and he hasn't moved on l much since last time we spoke. Phil, uh, how this is going? How is it going over here? Well, I think I'm almost done, to be honest. I uh, know it doesn't seem like it, but uh, yeah. Well, you're, you're far more optimistic than me and uh, sure. the others. No, that's fine. I mean, you know, I feel like there's somewhat of an Iberian connection going on with Bruno and Antonio, but uh, it's fine, you know. I'll, 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 keep on, I'll keep on doing it for myself. It's fine. I think Phil is suggesting there is some cheating over the other team, but uh, I have to say there hasn't been any foul play and I am watching what's going on at the other team also. So let's go back to you, Dion, and uh, come back and revisit what uh, Bruno is doing later on. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to be joined this time as we move over to the corner to Kyle. Kyle is going to be telling us about uh, gyroscope and gyroscopic forces, aren't you? Yeah, absolutely. So I think perhaps if we start uh, the other way around this time, so we're going to talk a little bit about the real-world application of gyroscopes. So gyroscopes are seen uh, in a lot of applications, actually, from the spacecraft industry, uh, aircraft, as Matt mentioned before, and also utilising um, a gyroscope on a ship, either perhaps for navigation and also for stability. Um, obviously, you know, the yaw and everything else that you get on the sea. Um, if you take a bicycle wheel, for example, um, and spin it and then hold the centre axis, um, you will uh, feel a force as you try to turn that spinning wheel. And that force is the gyroscopic action that's trying to react to you spinning and turning that wheel. If you imagine as well a motorbike, for example, mm -hmm. when it takes a corner, um, that again is a gyroscopic action that's keeping that motorbike upright. So the tech equipment piece of kit really um, exemplifies really well to students that theory um, with allowing them to uh, rotate a precision motor 
uh, sorry, a procession motor um, and a rotor motor. Um, so we zero everything back to zero. You can take your speed re reading, your force, um, and also the couple force in Newton meeting newton meters and as, as well in addition you can also extract that information into our vdas software which allows you then to create it into a graphic graf graphical format if i can get my words out um, for those who don't know about vdas let's just to explain a little bit more yep. vdas is the versatile data Take, acquisition yeah absolutely so there's three formats isn't there so we've got um, the benchtop vdas system which is a block system um, we've also got the VDAS F, which is a system which you typically would see with our wind tunnel range, for example. Um, so you'd have that mounted on a onto on a, a frame. frame. That's, that's correct. That's what the F yep, stands the for. Yeah. Yep. Very well. Um, and also, um, we've got the VDAS on board, which is basically an integrated system that's built into our equipment, as you can see with this particular piece of equipment. So, so you, the you've got the hardware though. So just to make explain, you've got the hardware that's either in the equipment, yep. on the frame, or as a separate box. Yep. And then you've got the software side of it, which is available to download free from, from our website um, on the download section. And that means that any student can plug in their own laptop, download the software to be able to work with the piece of equipment that they're working with in the moment. And effe effectively extract the data yeah. from and then obviously and then work go around on the formula. To do more charting and things yeah, like that. Yeah, absolutely. And then take it out to Excel. Yeah. Okay. So with this particular piece of equipment, if we actually run it, so if we run the um, rotor motor in an angular, so this is this red motor that you can see at the back here. Um, if we gradually increase the revolutions, and then also increase the rotation in a clockwise direction, you can see this coupling effect where you then can take the data back um, and then really analyze how the varying um, rotation affects the force output and understand the gyroscopic theory, which is again coming back to that bicycle mm -hmm. wheel. So, yeah, that's pretty much it Brilliant. on the gyroscope theory. Thank you very much, Kyle. Thanks, Dion. Uh, now we're going to go back to the race car uh, challenges, the elastic band challenges in the corner. I, I see good progress. So, we're going to transition at this point. Adnan, I mustn't forget your microphone, because nobody will be able to hear you. Um, Adnan, I'm going to give you the microphone now. If you can tell us more about, uh, this is, this is uh, like the final furlong here. Dion, a lot has happened since we last spoke, and to be honest, I'm as, su as surprised as the next person in this room. I have to s I'll start with Bruno, because we've got a great progress here on, uh, on this side. Bruno, tell me, oh, how did you do it? Yes, well, it has been a good challenge so far. Written the instructions and follow, follow it through. So please put some, some likes on, on, on our video and some comments suggesting what, how to improve this car and supporting our team. Well, look, I, I l it looks not too bad, but we'll have to test it later on to, to tell and see how it does or does not work. Phil. I have to say, I'm, I'm surprised from the last time I saw you, you've, uh, you've now gone through and we've got a almost functioning car, have we? Oh, it's a functioning car. I'm not surprised. Oh, you <laughs> let's, let's have a look. Can you, can you show the, our YouTube of guys around? Sure, of course. I mean, all you have to do is just twist it up, right? And then let it go. Right? Okay. See, there it goes. Phil, can you come <laughs> closer to the camera? Let's oh, have sorry. a look at that <laughs> now. I mean, let's you know, it's easy. You just twist up, right? Twist it up here without breaking the rubber band and then eventually it just goes right yes. so you've got an idea about how to progress with this so you've heard it here now dion i think we're ready to see who's got the best car great right we're going to go back to matt in the corner now um matt you're going to be telling us all about the whirling of shafts experiment i am indeed can you start with why Why do we need to understand shafts and what's going on here and, and the whirling of shafts okay. in real life? Um, so shafts, uh, shafts in, in, in this respect are essentially a device or a component within a machine that's going to transmit a rotational force from one point to another. In this case, we're transmitting a force from, well, that's being applied by the motor, in many other cases, it's going to be coming out of a gearbox from an engine, um, and your car is a great example of that, where you're transmitting a force from the engine to 
through the gearbox to your wheels. Not at all like our elastic band race cars. Unfortunately then. not. I can't see many gearboxes being uh, <laughs> assembled over there. Um, maybe next time. Uh, the, um, the whirling of shafts is particularly important where you have high-speed shafts or where you have shafts that could possibly be um, subjected to vibrations as they go through their resonance um, frequencies. Uh, so it's really important for students to get to grapes with this, it's really important for them to understand it. Uh, we'll see in, a, in a, a little while, we'll turn it on, um, it is going to be slightly restricted so we're not going to see the full amplitude of the vibrations, but we will be able to see why this is quite important um, when designing machinery. The equipment itself um, consists of, as I say, a motor, that motor drives a shaft via a bearing that bearing can either be free or we can change the end condition so that the bearing uh, sorry the bearing can either be restricted as it is right now or we can change the end change the end condition by removing the cap and allowing it to be self-centering okay through the equipment we have two bushes we have a, a string in the center here, which is currently restricting that amplitude. And we have another bearing at the other end, which again is capable of either being fixed in place or free, um, or free to, uh, to change its direction and be self-centering. So changing those end conditions, that's part of the investigations that students would do. In addition, we also have a variety of different, um, of different shafts that students can fit. We've currently got a 7mm shaft in there. We have a, a 6mm shaft and we have a 3mm shaft and a shorter 3mm shaft, which allows students to look at both the change in um, diameter and the change in length and see how that affects the, uh, affects the world speeds. It's very easy to operate. We've got a simple on-off here, and we'll drive the motor using this pot, which will then give us our speed output in revs per minute, rads per second, and hertz. Fantastic. Um, let's see it running, shall we? Yeah. So as we start to increase We can see. It is meant to do that, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is meant to do that. That is the entire point of the experiment. That is what we call the fundamental world speed for this particular setup. Now, as it is right now, we have a eccentric mass fitted to a seven millimeter bar with fixed end conditions. I could swap the eccentric mass out for some non-eccentric masses, which would allow me to do other investigations. With this, with this um, connected in the middle, the string connected in the middle to dampen that amplitude, we can actually force it beyond its first, um, beyond its fundamental uh, whirl frequency, and bring it to its secondary um, whirl frequency. The um, where we have the string. That position is the maximum amplitude, which is called the anti-node. Okay. At each end, for the fundamental system, we're going to have the nodes. And then when we bring this into its second world speed, we're going to end up with three nodes and two anti-nodes, which is what these bushes are for. Okay. We need these bushes to prevent the amplitudes of the vibrations from becoming too great and damaging the equipment or causing harm. Okay, how many well modes? It's restricted to only doing the two, yep. um, which is plenty for students to investigate um, both the concepts of the fundamental world speed and the multiples of that as well right. without um, risking the equipment being dangerous. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, I've got to tell those uh, elastic band car challenges that the time is now. Uh, the time has come where you need to bring up your cars to the uh, to the racetrack. Uh, I'd like to call it a racetrack, but it's um, the length of the demo room. Matt, would you mind just laying that down for me on yep, the floor? No over problem here, whatsoever. Please? Uh, we've where, got where are we? Where are we starting? Just over here, just please. Over here. We've got Phil. Come on in, Phil. Phil. Mm -hmm. Well, look uh, at that. Uh, what have you called it? Has it got a name? Yes, it's Phil number one. 
Phil number one. <laughs> and it's even got money on it. What's yeah. this? If you can see right here. It's 50p on there. What's that all about? I, in my idea, I thought maybe I'll put a bit of weight on top of the axle. Oh, oh, oh right. Okay. Traction. Okay. Yeah. And we've got elastic <laughs> bands on the wheels to increase the traction that we've got there. Um, brilliant. Um, Bruno is, is still um, putting on his elastic yeah. bands. Come on, Bruno. Are you going for elastic bands or not? No. No, I don't, I don't think you, you don't need them. Oh, okay. We just need to pivot this around the other way. Let's put it. Oops. I'm getting a little enthusiastic. Yeah. So I think let's, um, let's just have a quick look at Bruno's car here. You're actually looking very similar here. You've got, um, yeah, you've got extra spacers on your car and you've only got spacers on one end. Let's see yeah, if that makes my, a difference. My front wheels are actually narrow. They're narrower, yeah. okay. They wobble yeah, about a bit, so. okay, let's see. Um, what have you called your car? Uh, hashtag TQ. Hashtag, hashtag TQ, right, okay. Um, let's do these one at a time. We also have one car that's been made by um, some children, actually, <laughs> from our friends and family event. So no pressure, but we want to see if you can do better than this car. I think, Matt, can you come in and, um, uh, this is the Lily car, by the way. Um, we wind up the Lily car and let's see how far we can get it to go. The right. pressure's on. Let's have a look at the Lily car. Uh, what we do is whenever we do a series of the event, these events, we, um, we do friends and family event, we do an academic event. Matt, how do you think this will go? Well, I think even after Bruno's attempt at sabotaging this earlier and its, uh, its maintenance afterwards, I still think it's going to do better than, uh, than our sales team's cars. Okay, thank you, Bruno. That is despicable behaviour. Uh, let's go for it. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Are you getting nervous, gentlemen? Okay. Do we only have one attempt? <laughs> yes. <laughs> one time and one time only here on the Theory of Machines Live. Phil, go on, load up the car. Let's put it on the, uh, on the track there. Break. <laughs> How are you feeling about this? Yeah, I'm feeling very confident. Feeling very good. good. Phil is so cool about this. Let's see if it pays off. Oh, <laughs> quick. Go on, <laughs> turn it around the other way. <laughs> It was working. <laughs> oh, 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 well done. Okay. Um, well, I think we'll, yeah, we'll need to keep that out of the way. Bruno, how are you feeling about your car? Uh, I'm a bit nervous now, but it should be okay. As long as it moves, it will be a good start. Well, let's hope it does better than the car you tried to sabotage. Let's go for it then. Oh, yes. well, <laughs> Mr. Competitive clearly <laughs> has done it. Well done, Bruno, for your time building the Elastic Band Race Car Challenge. We will put a link in, um, in, the, in the box below with instructions of how to make your own Elastic Band Car Challenge. Why not have a go at home? Why not post your, um, your pictures in the description and comment box? Now I'd like to pull in the team as we round up the session for today. That's all from the team at Tech Equipment's headquarters in Long Eaton, UK. Um, I'd like to remind you all um, that you can still post your comments in the comment box below. Also that we will be doing our next live event on the 11th of June for thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, if you got that right. Um, you can look back at previous live YouTube events. We've got one on aerodynamics, one on civil engineering, and do check out our other videos. Thank you very much from all of us, and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.